I've made mistakes. You've probably made mistakes too. Today is about sharing those mistakes and about helping other people not make those mistakes again. You ever bought long-term food storage? I have. And I'll tell you, it was an interesting experience. I'm gonna give you a little bit of my background today and how I went from being a consumer to actually getting involved with a long-term food storage company. And I'm gonna give you my experiences through that of the five mistakes people make. And I'm gonna try to save you a bunch of cash today by telling you what not to buy from any vendor, even the ones that I've worked with, and how to really focus your plan on what you need to have. This one's gonna save you a bit of cash. I think it's a, a pretty interesting insight into the background of a food storage company. All right, guys, it's Joe here today, and we're gonna talk through uh, what are the five biggest mistakes that I see when um, people buy long-term storage food or when they're building a long-term storage food plan. Before we get into that, it's apropos, but let's, uh, let's give you just a holler out to our sponsor here today, Valley Food Storage. Uh, Valley Food Storage is a company I have a deep relationship with. It's a company whom I store their food in my house, but there's a deeper relationship there even further than that. And that's I've, I've done some consulting and helped them uh, innovate products and grow products that I want my family to eat and that I want to store. And they had asked me to come and help out and advise on uh, which and some of the directions to take the food that's gonna that you're gonna be seeing coming up here soon. And I really like where they're going with it. Um, but I've had some influence in the food that they're selling right now. And, and I really think it's something you should look at too. And I'm gonna give you the reasons why is because I'm gonna give you the answers to what I told them as well about the big mistakes that people make when buying long-term food storage. So uh, they're kind enough again for our listeners because of our relationship to um, give you guys 30% off if you're listening to this podcast. All you got to do is use that code NSRI30. It's NSRI30. Use that code. You get 30% off of $100 or more uh, there. And it's really great, clean food. My kids can read all of the ingredients um, no, with no problem, which is, which is awesome. I've given them some of the other competing ones, and we've had some troubles there with uh, some pretty big, fancy words. Uh, but they keep it pretty simple at Valley, and that's why I have sided with them. Um, I think they're a great company. So use that discount code. And uh, let's talk then about the big mistakes that people make when they're buying long-term food storage. Let's go ahead and start with number one, which is they buy food instead of fuel. So our body is just an engine, and it runs on fuel. And much like a uh, gasoline engine doesn't run on diesel fuel, we need a very specific type of fuel to run our engine, and that fuel is called calories. So when we have, um, when we're buying fuel for our body, what we're doing is trying to buy calories. Um, what people tend to do is buy by things like serving size or by the pound. Um, I've even seen people buy by the square foot, by companies advertising online. We're the cheapest per square foot. Well, yeah, no crap, because it's crap. Um, but is it fuel or is it just a giant bucket of crap, um, sugar water? So buy, purchase your food for the calories that it contains. Um, there are vendors online that will... Uh, that will sell by the serving size. And that's another one you gotta watch out for. Uh, it seems to make sense, but here's the big question. Who regulates serving size? Is it the FDA? Raise your hand if you think it's the FDA. Is it the USDA? Is it some other three to four letter abbreviated society somewhere that we that is either government or non-government? Who? The answer is nobody, nobody oversees this. Nobody's really watching what happens with serving size. And that's why you'll see folks out there online selling you a ton of servings to make theirs the cheapest per serving. Uh, there's one company online, and again, I'm not gonna, I've got a relationship here with Valley, I'm not gonna di diss everybody else here just for that, but I'm just being open and honest with you guys. Um, but I've got one other company that I saw where it takes 35.3 servings of their food just to get to 2,000 calories a day. So yeah, they're the cheapest, um, but like we said, if you ate four servings of that a day, you'd die and, um, you just wouldn't have enough calories to sustain life. So it, it is very deceiving. So when you're thinking about purchasing, um, purchase on calories, the measurement of the fuel for the engine of the body and don't purchase on, um, pound, we don't, we don't 
burn pounds, we burn calories. We don't burn servings, we burn calories. We don't burn square feet, we burn calories. So as you get that into your into your head, uh, it kind of s- makes sense, right? All right, so let's let's go to number two. Number two is, okay, so now we're buying on calories, but what's included in the fuel that we're buying? And this is really where I think it's important to, uh, get little, we're gonna get to a little bit of nutritionist stuff. I am not a nutritionist. Um, uh, we work with or nutritionists when we're getting into the nitty gritty details of stuff. But um, well, here's what I can tell you f- from my studies, and here's what I use to buy the food that I keep in my house. This is what I think through when I go through that process. So I'm buying calories. So that those are those proteins, right? Fats, carbohydrates, and sugars are types of fuel. I think of them different grades of gasoline. I've got like a 89 and 93, and you kind of run through all those different things. Those are different grades of fuel, and some are better than other grades of fuel. So it's worth paying a little bit more for a premium fuel sometimes uh, because it's better on your engine and because you'll get more miles out of it. So you have to be able to sometimes spend a little bit more to get the premium fuel. And by that, I'm really talking about proteins and fats. Proteins and fats are the premium grade of fuel for a reason, and that's how your body breaks them down and consumes them. Um, When you have a lot of carbohydrates and a lot of sugars, um, it can be okay in a survival situation, but what you're going to get there too is a lot of spikes in sugars, and it becomes a very dangerous game for 10% of the Americans who uh, do have like a type 2 diabetes or are working through issues with um, Alzheimer's, with um, heart disease, anything like that, where your, your influx of different chemicals in the body are going to be pretty rough on your system. So yeah, you might have enough food to survive, but if you don't have the right kind of food, it's going to give you problems. And that's what really tapers in when we're talking about number two, the right kind of calories. Um, let's not only talk about the those macronutrients, but the micronutrients. So not just the kind that our fuel burns, but what are the additives in the fuel that make the system run better? Uh, we're really Here's a rundown of, of a few of mine. I, I just picked six here for the sake of conversation because they're ones that I constantly look at. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the kinds of foods you need to you need to get in order to get these. So let's start with iron. Iron is what creates hemoglobin in the body. Hemoglobin is what's going to carry the oxygen to all the rest of your body. And it also is, um, the iron is going to support all your neurotransmitters. So in short, to, as I'm getting kind of nerdy here, um, it helps your muscles run by providing oxygen to them because it allows your blood to carry more oxygen. And it allows your brain to function at a higher level because your neurotransmitters are firing at a better uh, kind of pace there. So when you're thinking about being in a survival situation, being able to think on your feet and being able to have your muscles be as strong as they possibly can and uh, that fight or flight kind of thought process, giving your body the tools to be able to operate with that is super important. Um, If you don't get enough, the opposite is obviously true, right? You're not gonna be able to think sharply, your muscles are gonna fatigue. And uh, so we're looking for foods like legumes. When I say legumes, uh, I will say this a few times because it is kind of the keystone piece of everything that we have here. But we're really talking about things like beans, lentils, peas, um, soy. Those are things that are really going to keep the uh, iron high there. And that's that's what we really want to focus on. So, so kind of the second one is going to be folate. Folate is, um, we hear a lot of it when we we talk about um, pregnant women, but um, it it's really helps regenerate cells in the body, right? So your body's constantly um, losing old cells or cells are dying and you've got to replace them with new cells. And folate is really what keeps the body able to continue to rejuvenate cells. We can think about it in uh, kind of one of those things that helps keeps you looking young too. But it's one of the things that as, as we start to put our body under stress, Stress is going to try to rifle through those uh, that cell regeneration process a little bit faster than others. So when we're in a stress situation like a survival situation or like I just lost my job and and um, or the, the car broke down and I can't afford it. Any of those situations we talk about from a practical standpoint, um, folate is one that's going to help your body cycle through cells appropriately and rejuvenate and keep everything running as it needs to. So again, l- the legumes are awesome there. Asparagus. Eggs and bananas, those are, I would steer you towards those as foods that are going to help you get that intake and that balance. 
Next, zinc is what we, we take the little zinc tabs when we get a cold, right? So zinc fights viruses and bacteria. It's been proven to do so. It helps your immune system, helps keeps you healthy. When you're uh, in a situation, again, like a survival situation or like any situation that is not a survival situation, getting sick can be bad news. It's increasingly bad news when there's no doctor or there's no pharmacy that you can get to. So staying on top of your body health is going to be very important. And that's why I threw zinc in there. I think it's a top one. It's going to come in our meats. Um, so any, any type of the proteins we're going to get, uh, legumes again, dairy eggs, whole grains, and potatoes. Potatoes are an interesting one, but they are, uh, they are a great source of zinc and a good one to go to. Next on the list is iodine. Iodine uh, helps helps you maintain your thyroid. So your your thyroid maintains your metabolism. It excretes hormones that maintain your metabolism. And uh, it is basically what allows your body to metabolize all these micronutrients that we're talking about because the thyroid is excreting the right hormones that allows this to happen. So we want to continue to give that thyroid exactly what it needs. And that's iodine is going to help to do that. Um, here's the tricky part. So where does it come from? Uh, you can get it from dairy, uh, but the main source is iodized sodium. Uh, this is the part where I've got to explain, um, not all sodium is bad. When we construct freeze dried food, we do not need sodium to preserve it. So why is there sodium in freeze dried food? The reason is really because it, we add it back in for two reasons. One's for taste. And the second is to make sure you have the right level of iodine. And iodine, for those folks that are medical professionals or, or dietary folks or nutritionists, 20, 2,400 uh, milligrams a day is about where they want you to be. And that's where you want to be on a normal system. When you're not sweating a lot, as you sweat, the iodine leaves the body and then it's diluted down and it's not enough for your... Uh, thyroid to be able to function right correctly or we've, we can get to, to hyperthyroidism we, we can overdo it um, and believe it or not whether you underdo it or overdo it the effects on the thyroid are similar they're going to be it's you're going to have some complications uh, that are there and so they're trying to find that right balance what I'm going to say is it's iodinized sodium this is why your doctor if you have a heart condition would say hey you need to switch over to sea salt which is non-iodinized salt because it doesn't contain the iodine levels. It has a, it's trace amounts, but it doesn't contain the iodine levels that we have in iodinized salt or the table salt that we really would think about. That's why we're going to find uh, people will, will email or call in a lot to a food company and say, wow, man, the salt content's really off. My doctor really wants it lower than that. And it's right, because this is meant for higher stress situations where you're chopping wood or you're farming or you're collecting uh, wood or whatever you need to do to continue your status in life, uh, it's going to be a little bit more work probably than most of us do, unless you are a farmer or you're someone who works with their hands or construction or labor, um, then it might might be right where you need to be and therefore you don't need some of the higher sodium ones and then you should watch it. But I don't have a problem getting 3,000 plus uh, milligrams of sodium in a daily diet when we're highly active. Um, that's why you're going to find Gatorade and things like that are going to have sodium in them to help replenish the, uh, stuff you're sweating out and to keep you balanced. That's iodine. I thought that was important because people always, um, ask about salt. Um, magnesium is the next one. Magnesium supports muscle growth. Uh, it, it also helps, um, with the immune system. And I think the biggest piece here, magnesium along with vitamin D is are ones that maintain and balance your glucose. So again, I said, you know, there's about 10% of the population in the United States that is pre-diabetic or diabetic in type two. And that group of individuals, and if you're prepping for someone in prepping for a group of people, it's not just you or your immediate family, and you have people with specific conditions, um, heart conditions or diabetes, those tend to be the two biggest ones that I hear people are prepping for that along with dietary restrictions. If you're prepping for people like that, you're going to want to include food that is going to really help um, support magnesium. It's going to help balance out. And, and, and you should plan to decrease the amount of carbohydrates. Carbohydrates, as they transfer into sugars, are consumed super fast, and they create insulin spikes that are dangerous. So you want to stick on a higher protein, higher fat diet. 
and um, you want to stick with the foods that produce this magnesium. So those are legumes again, whole grains, bananas made the chart here again, and you got you to get enough to get in that balanced amount of where you need to be. Same for, um, I would say vitamin D is another one of those that lowers lowers insulin as opposed to kind of balances a little bit lowers insulin and also fights kidney failure and heart failure. Kidney failure and heart failure are the two main conditions that result from um, uncontrolled insulin in the body. So it's a great one to stay ahead of as well too. So vitamin D should be on that list. And the last one would be vitamin A. Vitamin A, you're going to find in eggs, uh, breakfast cereals, like your multigrains and things like that, um, fortified milk, um, carrots, and broccoli. All those are going to be ones that are going to contain that vitamin A. And that's this is a regeneration one that has two specific organs that it really focuses on, and that's skin and your eyes. And I think about in survival situations, being able to, uh, if I'm normally sitting at a desk, which is not unusual for me, uh, when I go outside and I'm exposed to weather on a more constant basis, my skin is going to start to take a beating. I'm going to start to get uh, chafes or calluses. I'm going to start to get uh, wind burn and things like that, depending on the temperature, uh, sunburn. Uh, vitamin A is going to help you regenerate that skin through and also your eyes. If you think about not getting the right type of vitamins can start to have a negative impact on your eyes in a survival situation we want to be able to see that buck that's walking through our yard and be able to see through that scope and be able to take that shot if i need to or anything else i need to do to defend me or my family but uh, maintaining that eye health and skin health i think are very important as those irritations of the skin are a lot of times can lead to larger problems so that was my big list of micronutrients and uh, sorry, that one got a little long, but I wanted to give you guys some background, not just on what you need in the food, but how do you get it? So again, going through understanding you know, the legumes and eggs and, and things like that, uh, fortified, fortified, fortified milk's important too, because it also contains iron. Um, so that's a great one to jump on as well, because it, it's going to check off a couple boxes. And then all the other um, you know, fruits and vegetables that I had mentioned along the way here, um, all of those are in my show notes for today. So if you missed it as we went through it or you're driving, don't uh, feel bad. You can just go ahead and click on the show notes and it's all kind of detailed in there for you. So let's go to number three. I just told you that legumes like the beans and lentils, peas, anything comes in a pot, really. Uh, Soy, those are all great sources of a ton of uh, micronutrients. There are also uh, types of things where if you have vegan or vegetarian folks within your party, they're going to be safe uh, getting a hold of that stuff. So when you're making your, your bean soups, beans uh, in your stews. And um, there, we've got a bunch of them that we worked with at, at Valley Foods. They create some different bean chilies and things like that. Um, but as you go through, um, understand we put those things into foods and prepared foods. But this is the third mistake I think people make, and that's paying for fillers. Filler, I think of beans as a filler. If I were to buy a bucket of beans online, I'm now paying someone to ship that to that location and then fly it over to me and pay for all all the expenses and marketing and everything it got me to get there to go buy that. Or I can just go to the local store, my grocery store, or a Sam's Club, Costco, big box you know, store, and I can buy a giant bag of beans. I can throw it in a five-gallon pail and seal that thing up, and it's going to be good. Hey, I, I've seen people uh, blogging about it lately, about they have beans that have been uh, been around for 30 years and they're open them up and they rehydrate just fine and don't have any have any problems there. So when I talk about paying for fillers, uh, I mean just don't don't pay for food, especially in the freeze dried world. Freeze dried is very expensive. It's it's the best way to preserve food because of the science behind it. You're freezing food at room temperature, um, which is gonna keep all of the micronutrients and the calories in the food, but reduce the water down to just about a percent of what it originally was, uh, which is about all the weight you have left. And it is shelf stable there for what we believe to be 25 years. Um, and we'll, we'll get into that a touch here in a second. But overall, you're getting the best possible way of doing it. So do you need to freeze dry beans? I equate freeze drying beans to putting a life jacket on a seal. Uh, the thing is gonna float on its own. You're just, it doesn't add anything. It's no value. Um, but when you bag it with other things that are that need freeze drying in powder form, then they they too it just makes sense to freeze dry it all together. So um, I, I guess my my two cents here would be um, don't pay for a paying for fillers. Don't pay for a freeze dried food 
that will last 20 years on its own, um, buy it locally. And buy local everywhere you can. So don't buy that. And then the other side of fillers, besides beans and rice and things like that, um, flour, that stuff, you know, don't need to buy that online. Um, once you buy that stuff, uh, and in addition to that would be any kind of drink stuff that you like. Like I think of fillers as being sh- processed sugary drinks. Um, you'll see lemonade and orange drinks and things like that often um, in some of these websites. And I'm just like, I if I really needed a giant box of Country Time Lemonade, I can just get that locally too. I don't need to get that shipped to me on an airplane. So all that together, um, it's not going to last any longer than anything you would buy locally anyways. That's it's why I advise Valley not to sell it, just from a, a, a practical prepping standpoint. So all that together, um, don't waste money on anything you can get local that's just self-stable on its own. Uh, you've got better ways. And then when you're buying food, you're going to not need to buy for 2,000 calories because you have calories now sitting in your pantry. And uh, that really takes me right into the next one, which is number four, overbuying. So when I say overbuying, I mean too many people see the the sticker price on on long-term food storage and they're like, man, that's very expensive. The truth is it, it is more expensive than dehydrated, jarred, canned, and all that other stuff. But that's really part of your food plan needs to be all that other stuff. So I think people overbuy because I think they try to buy 2,000 calories a day worth of um, you know, freeze-dried food. And I, I just don't think you need it. I think if you've got all that stuff I just talked about that's already in your pantry. So you've got five-gallon buckets of each of the type of legumes and rice and, and oats and flour. You got all that stuff that was there and you paid pennies, honestly, for it. Then uh, you've got hundreds of calories a day that you have right there. In addition to that, there's no substitution for fresh or close to fresh food. So you've got stuff in your freezer. That's uh, probably the best way to preserve food in a short term. Um, The reason it's not long term is because frozen food will excrete moisture. When it excretes moisture and hits that frozen temperature, it freezes on the outside. We call that uh, freezer burn. Freezer burn is going to have a negative impact on the vitamin quality of that food and the micronutrients. So we, we want to eliminate keeping stuff in the freezer for a long time. But I do have, you know, I, I've got a week's worth of stuff in my freezer. I've got a week's worth of stuff in my fridge. And then canning and jarring, I buy an extra can every time I go to the store of whatever. If I use a can of green beans, and I usually buy frozen green beans, but if I had a, I have cans of green beans. If I use a can of green beans, um, I'm going to go back and buy two cans next time. And I'll use one and I'll buy two more. And I'll use one and I'll buy two more. And next thing I know, I've got a bunch of green beans and I did it at 70 cents a piece. And it didn't really hurt the wallet that bad. And it's stuff I eat. That's why I'm going through it. And then from that point, once I get to like six, seven cans of green beans, I mean, I'm not looking to stock up that much on green beans, but if I get, you know, six, seven cans of each, now I just rotate through it like a store would. I just eat whatever's in front. And when I buy a new one, I shove it in the back and, and go from there. Um, you know, there, there are folks that want to have lots and lots and lots of green beans. I want to put them in number 10 cans, but I'm just buying you know, smaller stuff I know I can use. I'm going to eat through it as my family. I'm just going to replenish it. Once I get to a certain point, it's not going to cost me anymore. So I've got all my canned stuff. Um, I've got all my jarred stuff, everything from my garden that I've had for the year. Uh, I've jarred up all the excess that I didn't eat during the summer. And now I've got my local nutrients and I've really focused my garden now on what I'm good at growing. So I originally grew like 25 different things and, and now I grow like six things. Uh, I just grow more of those and then I jar those and I don't ever buy those anywhere else because I have enough of them to, uh, to grow, you know, my, my peppers, you know, onion squash, uh, those things that I, I can grow really easily in my climate. I'm just going to grow them here. So now when I'm planning about buying long-term food storage, I'm really only looking to get 1200 to 1600 calories a day because I'm going to supplement that for the first week with frozen and refrigerated. After that, I'm going to move to canned and jarred. Uh, and, and even after that, I do have some additional supplemental freeze dried in the form of, uh, you know, vegetables and fruits. Uh, th- that's, that's my plan. And that there were, therefore I'm knocking off 25, 30% of the cost of acquiring long-term food storage, uh, which I think is pretty good. And you can add in anything else you can do, you know, smoked, um, you know, things like that, where you're getting your beef jerkies or any kind of, um, any kill you've had from the season you want to. Um, preserve it in that way. You want to balance out not overdoing it on smoked um, foods and dehydrated foods. Dehydrated dehydrated foods, my only warning there is in in small amounts, great. Um, 
when you dehydrate food, you're also dehydrating any toxins in the food. Uh, so you're reducing, you're, you're excising the water and then leaving back whatever's left. And so you're, what you're ending up with is an increased amount if there is a bacteria or something that got into that. You've got more of that bacteria per ounce now because you've gotten rid of all the water. Therefore, the ounces went down, and now it's more concentrated, um, like buying concentrated laundry detergent or whatever, right? So uh, just you know, be careful in that because you're concentrating good and bad bacteria together. But especially if you're if you're drying out a meat or something in the sun and it's out there, or pasta is out hanging for three days, um, then you've got uh, increased exposure to animals, increased exposure to um, bacteria, anything that's out there, fungi that can taint it. And then you store that and dry it out and, and you've got a concentrated p- portion of it. So not, I'm not saying don't make pasta. I make my own pasta. I use my own pasta. Um, I just don't let it sit for more than a month or, or two, even in the dried form. And, uh, or I'll just try to make it, uh, I'll just keep, you know, flour on hand and, and eggs and I'll make it on the go when I need, when I need it, as opposed to making too much ahead of time. Obviously, it's different in a little bit of a commercial facility. They've got a little more control over how the drying process works. Um, and there are some chemicals that um, come in to the phenylene that comes into smoking as you smoke the the charring and the smoke that is happening on the wood chips is actually turning into a, a low level of what's basically embalming fluid. Uh, so it's not a great long term. It is a preservative. It is what preserves the meat from... Um, from having any problems with the bacteria. Uh, But it's also the same thing we use to preserve um, our loved ones when we put them in the ground. So you you can see it's not a great thing, and it is linked uh, long-term to cancer. So we want to minimize the amount that we we use of all of our smoked. I'm not saying don't eat smoked. I'm not saying don't eat dried. I'm just saying moderate it with everything else, and there are reasons real scientific reasons why you should moderate it with everything else. You're not going to get cancer from eating beef jerky. Uh, but if all you ate was smoked food that you smoked, um, it, it could have some long-term negative effects. So just be aware of those long-term negative effects and then manage those. All right, so that's over buying. Make your own stuff, can your own stuff, buy less um, from any of the major manufacturers online. I think you you can get away with having my food plan is 30% of my food plan is local. And then the rest I've supplemented um, with long-term food storage that I don't have to swap out or eat through. It can kind of sit. That doesn't mean I don't eat through it or don't swap out, but that really takes me to my last one I want to talk to you today about. And that's understanding how long the food lasts. We talked about freeze-dried food being the best way to preserve food out there. And every freeze-dried company is going to say that their food lasts 25 years. And they're all going to have a taste guarantee for 25 years. And I think every food company means it. I just want to also say that I've read most of the scholarly works um, on um, freeze-dried food and on both preservations in number 10 cans and in Mylar bags. And there are some uh, studies that are conclusive, some inconclusive. I think some of them, the test samples are just um, too small to really count as, as being empirical. But I think what you got to take into consideration here is um, it's going to be okay. Are all the micronutrients going to be there in 25 years? I don't think so. That's my take on it. Um, are Is it going to be safe to eat? Yes. I think it will be safe to eat. I think it'll be safe to eat in, in 30 years. Um, I think it will probably taste not so great in 30 years. I think it will have uh, 70 or 80% of the nutrients in 30 years that it has today. But um, again, I'm not a nutritionist. I'm just basing this as as inferences off of the studies that I've been reading. Um, Overall, though, you're going to see companies that are now going and saying, oh, we're we're toting a 30-year taste guarantee. So again, we haven't proven that there's 30 year that 30 years food can sit in a number 10 can and not taste like a number 10 number can not taste like a tin can when we get it back. So um, it's a lot of marketing hype. It doesn't mean to throw all the crap away that's 25 years old. It does for me, let me focus on kind of that 20 year mark because we do have studies that have lasted 20 years and we can conclusively say that 20 years there are there are techniques that have been able to preserve it that long. Remind you, those techniques are 20 years old. We have new techniques now. So does it mean that 30 years could be the new mark 30 years from now because we're using 20 year better technology? Sure, could be. We won't know for 30 years. 
So we can make claims against it, uh, but I think a lot of the companies are just either going to say, if crap hits the fan, you're going to eat it anyways. Um, if it tastes bad, come let us know. The small amount of people that do will take care of it, or they'll be out of business in 30 years and they won't have to make right by it anyways. So just you know, be, be leery of when people are making astro- 50 year taste guarantee all right well I, they're they're betting you're not going to be around to claim it or something right um go with the science science is about 20 years eat through the food you have so if you bought i know i know a lot of people who in their 20s are going to go buy a month two months three months and i i would my goal is to get up to a year of food on hand at any given point in time that really mitigates a lot of risk for me and my family but if you had three months of food on hand and you're 15 years in, uh, it probably doesn't hurt to start buying a one-week kit every couple paychecks. Uh, maybe once a month you get a week's worth of food that shows up, and then you start to work that into your monthly food plan so that you start to replace your food at the 15-year mark, understanding that as expensive as freeze-dried food can be, it's still under 2 bucks. Um, two bucks, I'll say serving again, but um, my serving is really about eight servings a day is what you need as a 200 pound man to, to get by on average. Um, but it, you're still under two bucks a serving, um, on the average serving. That's what I'm going to go by. Uh, so all that being said, it's not, it is expensive, but it's probably no more expensive than what you're eating right now. If not, it's probably cheaper when you think about, um, trying to make a chicken teriyaki at home, you would need to go get a chicken. You need to go get pineapples. You need to go get oranges. You'd have to go get um, soy sauce. All the different things you got to go get. You got to, you know, and then you have to make all the. You have to make soy sauce out of soybeans. You know what I mean? It's going to be a process to really get it all together. And by the time you're all done, you could spend you know, a lot of money on that. Even if you were just making it, buying it at the store, you're probably going to spend four or five bucks on a microwave meal that's going to be less quality than this. So find kind of food you like to eat, store the kind of food you like to eat, um, store the food you're eating now, meaning cans, um, freezer, keep your freezer full all the time. We That's just a no-brainer, right? We know if the power goes out, a full freezer is going to last longer than a half full freezer. And rotate through your food. And that's really the five things that I am going to suggest that you do. And uh, if this was helpful to you, write me. Let me know. And let me know if you've made other mistakes and you've adjusted those mistakes along the way. I'd love to post them here on this page for anybody that's coming back to it now, a year, two years later, and needs some help on how to select um, their food or how to get into the game of selecting food. Um, and, and comment to me, guys. I've got a direct line back to these uh, food vendors. Uh, I've got a, a small podium where I can talk about food and maybe help, help influence the process, but I really want food to be healthy. I want it to be things that are non-GMO. I want it to be, you know, or even, I want it to be stuff that my kids can eat and I feel good about it. And that's really what this podcast was about today is how to keep some jingle in your pocket and how to make sure your family's safe, uh, that you've packed and you've thought through all the right things. And so again, let me know if you uh, if you like this podcast too. Please subscribe. I mean, I- I'm really blessed to see all the folks that continue week after week to increase our numbers here, and uh, and and it gives us good feedback that we're doing uh, great stuff at one heck of a good price, right? It's free. Uh, we're giving it away. I- I- we just love to see you guys consuming it and loving it. And so thanks so much. And keep that up and keep hitting subscribe for us and uh, and tune in each week. And thanks so much. And we'll talk again next week.